censorship by proxy is something that's being used recently, where the idea is that uh, maybe what these uh, private companies are doing is not censorship, but they're doing it under the influence of government. That is, the government is prodding them to do it. They can't pass a law. Is that then censorship? Yes, I think it is. And I think that is a real worry here. But I'm usually not sympathetic to the people raising this. Yeah. And we can talk about why. But I think it is a real worry here. It's my reading of Facebook, of what's happened with Facebook. And when, when you look at sort of uh, Zuckerberg's history, and what he said in responses to calls that, oh, Facebook shouldn't allow this on the, their platform and so on. I think he started off much more as, no, we believe in a lot of robust speech. People are going to disagree. And, so, and yeah, we're not going to have criminal things on our site, but the, we're going to have things that people don't like on our site. And you can see a movement towards then, I think in 2000 and March, 2019, he writes an op-ed about, oh yeah, government should regulate us. Yep. And that, that. Yep. that's a change, I think. And it's coming, or at least there's strong reason to think it's coming in part from government intimidation. I think. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's self-defense. He, he knows government is going to regulate them so you might as well get get ahead of the curve in a sense of, of defining what those regulations look like and not making sure that the regulations are not so harmful to your business. Um, it's and, sad that they have to do this. But. Yeah. I, and I think here the issue of antitrust yep. is important because it, I, I read again um, Zuckerberg's email, I mean, sorry, op-ed where he's, saying what we need is regulation. And he suggests some things and says, like, this is likely not everything, but this is a start and so on. Mm -hmm. Antitrust is the, one of the most non-objective areas of law. I mean, there's a point Ayn Rand stressed that you're basically guilty if you're in business under antitrust. Like you could be prosecuted under the antitrust laws if you're in business, because there's all kinds of contradictory um, vague, uh, arbitrary things in the antitrust laws. So you could see in a context where they're starting to, to talk about like, yeah, maybe Facebook's too big and we should use antitrust to uh, break it up. And did they should we really have allowed them to buy Instagram and think it's, you can't, there is no defense mm -hmm. in that. So that you would as think of a solution, like if we could get some better that it was so, wasn't so totally non-objective regulation where we could say, look, we're actually complying. Like, what's your problem? Pass different regulations and so on if you want something different, but don't come threatening us every month saying, look, if you don't do something, we're going to uh, break you up or do some damage to your company. It would be more clear cut what the regulation is. And if I mean, if you're faced with this kind of antitrust intimidation, I can see that as a, this is a, a way out is like, let's pass some regulation that I can actually meet. Um, now there might be an anti-competitive element to it. I mean, this is part of the tragedy when you get government involved like this. It is true, I mean, you know this, that the bigger companies can deal with regulation. So there is a phenomenon of when companies get big, they ask for regulation of the industry, knowing that that will make it harder for, startups to compete because they can't comply. I mean, the compliance costs with regulation or I mean, the better term is government controls are yeah. high. But I don't, I mean, that's not my read of the primary thing going on with Zuckerberg. No, I don't think so either. I mean, there's no, and, and I mean, the whole antitrust thing is so ludicrous. There's so many different um, social media platforms right now. I just got invited to a new one two days ago called Clubhouse. Never heard of it. Um, but all the Silicon Valley people on Clubhouse, and it's uh, it's it's more based on verbal discussion, not video, not writing, but just just uh, people talking. And um, every, you know, they keep popping up. I mean, new ones keep coming up. So the whole idea that there's some monopoly here or, 
or dominance uh, is is ludicrous, but it's used as because it's so non-objective because there are no standards. It you it's used as a way to put pressure on these companies to to do what the government wants it to do, and in that sense, to the extent that it causes them to silence themselves or to silence others, that's the sense in which it's proxy by it's censorship by proxy. Yeah, and I'd be more sympathetic if the first time these companies were hauled before Congress and it's, you have Zuckerberg and um, Jack Dorsey, CEO of Twitter, and you have uh, Google sometimes didn't show up, but Google and Apple. And when they're being um, hauled before Congress and it's, it really is a show trial of what is going. If people at that time had said, Look, this is a violation of these companies' rights. This is a violation of freedom of speech. You're trying to get them to take actions against speech that uh, and content that you happen not to like. Yep. And it was, I mean, it's both sides of the aisle in Congress were they going out of the way to have sound bites and say, look how tough we were on Zuckerberg or on Dorsey. And they're, they're exercising their rights. And here it's the government threatening them. And if at that point, including like some of their smaller competitors saying, um, like if, if, if Parler say was defending Facebook at that time, I'd be more sympathetic to, or, or in the, I mean, they went after Amazon for antitrust, certainly Trump was saying, if companies at that point had said, Look, this is a this is really wrong. You should be. They're not monopolies. They're just good. And um, and when you start telling them this is how they have to make content decisions, th this is a violation of freedom of speech. I'd be more sympathetic than now when it's um, the it's they don't like what's happened to them now. That they, it would be. Look, we were trying to defend freedom of speech and defend these companies. But if you sort of look the other way or are happy when Congress goes after these companies because you think of them as monopolies or be a myth or whatever. And then it's, um, uh, you want to turn around and say, no, we shouldn't be do this. I, I don't have sympathy for that. Yeah, I mean, I agree. It's, it's uh, and nobody spoke up because I did. So I know I was the only one. Nobody yeah. spoke up. The Institute spoke up. Yeah. But other than objectivists, you really got nothing. The conservatives didn't. Uh, many of the libertarians either remain quiet or just it's not an issue that, you know, they hate big, right? So if it's yeah. if the government's attacking big tech, that's fine as long as we can, as long as we get our way. So nobody really stood up and you're right. Certainly the companies competing with these companies didn't stand up. And then when they, when they get in trouble, suddenly free speech is a big issue. Why wasn't free speech an issue at that point? It's yeah, because if, if you think of, even uh, so, if you think of Facebook, Twitter taking down Trump's things, but if you think even of um, the Amazon, to the the web service taking Parler off, you can wonder like, is it partly because of the intimidation and threats they're facing from government that it's um, look, well, we can use antitrust against you, Amazon too, and if you if you're allowing this kind of content and that it, it helped people storm the Capitol. And so like, you, you better worry about this. And it, I mean, it, it might be a safe course of action for them to say, okay, we're not going to host. I mean, it, it's not going to impact Amazon's bottom line very much that they don't have this one. And it might be, yeah, if this gets us on the good side of the antitrust busters. I mean, maybe we do it. So who do you blame in that circumstances? Because everybody's blaming Amazon. It's the one thing you don't blame. I blame everybody. It's the everybody who didn't speak up when this started happening. And it goes back at least. I mean, I do think I, I think you have that same view that a pivotal moment here was Microsoft and the Justice Department and that. Yep. And if if the business world and particularly the tech world doesn't speak up in defense of Microsoft and say this is outrageous. Um, yeah, even though it has 90% market share and so on, it's not a monopoly. It hasn't forced us to do it. It's just hard to compete with Microsoft. Um, and if, if you, that was the beginning, I think, of government seeing, yeah, we can 
get our hands on tech in a way that they were much more separate before that. And if certainly people in the tech world, but just more generally, people who are pro-freedom, if they didn't speak up, like this is a seminal issue. And if it goes badly, it's, it's going to have long-term consequences. Um, so the, I mean, the idea that you'd blame Microsoft or Amazon or Apple, it's, this is the last people to blame. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's stunning because during the Microsoft case, like two so-called libertarian CEOs in Silicon Valley, one supported the government and one just stayed quiet, which is Sam McNeely at Sun, actually, who was on the board of Cato at the time. He supported the government in going after Microsoft. And, um, and Larry Ellison at Oracle just, I think, stayed quiet yeah. and, and they didn't speak up. And partially, I can understand it because they were probably afraid that they would go after them next. But yeah, I mean, that fear, this is what you get. You get government grow, more and more influential in tech business. And then tech companies do stuff in order to try to appease government because they have no choice because the, the alternative is that they get crushed and they know that. And yeah. then people blame the, yeah, it drives me nuts. I mean, I can understand blaming the government for being in that position. And, and as you say, the companies who didn't stand up to defend them, but to blame Amazon for it. And, and I'm not even talking about the Parler case where they were, Amazon warned Paula over and over again, supposedly, at least according to the judge who did not give um, Paula the, um, did not rule in their favor for, for an injunction. Uh, the, the, court, the court, you know, they haven't had the trial yet, but at least the injunction. He said, you know, look, Amazon warned you. You didn't live, you didn't, you didn't live up to your agreement with Amazon. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, these tech companies and um, so we've got we've got so so we got Twitter we got Facebook we got Paula we got all these all these entities when they restrict somebody from posting like uh, they restricted Donald Trump and I, I I you know the first it's interesting how people think about these issues right uh -huh. the first thing that came to my mind when Twitter restricted Donald Trump's speech was and I think I tweeted this was I'm so happy I live in a country where a private company can you know, ban the president from using its platform. I mean, that to me was just, whether you agree with Twitter's decision or not, yeah. the ability to do that was like, yes, this is fantastic. What a, what a, what a great idea. You know, because you can do that in China or in Tokyo. Or in, I, my guess is in a lot of countries. I, I mean, I wonder if in Israel you could, you could say, Prime Minister, you can't post anything. My guess is the answer is no. Yeah. So uh, we still live in a country where there is that. So what, first of all, what do we call that if it's not censorship? Um, I mean, the, one of the terms that you used is de-platform. I think if you understand what that term means, it's the right term. It's we've built the platform. Yep. We decide who uses it and not. And if you're meeting our either sort of formal terms of services or informally, the, the, like the reason we created this and we want to create something of value and so on. And keep in mind, like Trump was on these platforms for a long, long time. Yep. So, but it's after January 6th, if it's even, so you might think there's government pressure for them to do this. And again, the anti, but even if there was, if it, even if, the, so let's just say for the sake of argument, it was for Twitter, Jack Dorsey after January 6th, it was, yeah, this is too much. I don't want to be part of this anymore. And even if, if Trump's not legally guilty of incitement, it's from a moral point of view, this was inciting a crowd the, and I don't want to give this person a platform anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree completely with your reaction that it's great to live in a country where that is possible. And notice even the European Union, I think Merkel and others, it was like, really, a company can do this? And it and that's the, I mean, Ayn Rand pointed out many times about Europe, like their statism is much more ingrained that like, doesn't government have absolute power sort of? And then we claw, we get some permissions and claw it back a bit, but it's like that reaction. Really, gov a private company can kick off the president, and the president can't just say, "No, I'm nationalizing your company" or whatever. And yeah, I agree with you completely. It's to live in a place where that's possible. It's that is so rare historically. It's so rare now, and it's what freedom. It's part of what freedom means. 
what we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see, see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share, and uh, you can support the show at yourownbookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value hopefully you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if you... Even if you just come here to troll, or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe, because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified. Right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please. <laughs> 